Hello and welcome to the second lecture for um, this lecture series, uh, AC1005, looking at um, built heritage. So what do we mean by built heritage? What we would think of is that everything around us that we see built, everything from the past which we inherit into our present day society, um, is effectively our built heritage, all the man-made stuff around about us. So this can be monuments or archaeological sites, uh, parks, um, sometimes whole towns and villages, but primarily we would think of it as, as buildings. And it can be from many different ages, so it can be from modern day um, right the way back to prehistoric times. And why is it important? Our environment, the world that we live in, has been shaped by us for thousands of years. We've um, worked the land, we've created buildings, we've um, created settlements, and we have changed the, the way that the land is presented. Our um, occupation has um, altered this. And our culture is linked to our environment and built hard heritage and the buildings that we see around about us are very important parts of that. So the buildings that we see are the most obvious part of this built heritage because we still see them. Um, in Scotland we have significant buildings such as Edinburgh Castle, uh, we've got fantastic works of engineering like the Forth Road Bridge, but we also have um, humble domestic buildings which are worth considering and also help us understand um, where we came from. There's a couple of different ways that we can protect buildings in Scotland. Um, one of the significant ways that we look after um, some ancient buildings or um, uh, monuments is by using a, a, a scheduled item called a scheduled ancient monument. Um, there's a government body or a, a quango called Historic Environment Scotland which protects ancient monuments and these are usually things that are considered of national importance and this came about at um, the end of the 19th century when there was the Ancient Monuments Act passed and this is around about the time when we started getting interested in, in history and uh, realising that if we weren't going to protect it that some of these um, important historical sites would be lost. Um, modern listings are considered in a slightly different way. We've got um, a new policy from 2011, which is the Scottish Historic Environment Policy. And currently there are more than 8,000 scheduled monuments uh, across Scotland. We can also protect things um, which are internationally important by using uh, a UNESCO World Heritage Site um, protection and this started in um, the late or the early 1950s um, when there was a, a, a concerted effort to protect historic works which were going to be threatened by the Aswan Dam project in, in Egypt and uh, the United Nations Educational scientific and cultural organization, UNESCO, um, decided that they would um, e effectively list or schedule significant um, international works to be able to protect them. Um, they were seeing that these, these are kind of worldwide, of worldwide importance. So of 2018, there are just over a thousand sites worldwide on, on the register and six of those sites are in Scotland. Um, we have St Kilda, the Forth Road Bridge, New Lanark, um, Edinburgh Old Town, Edinburgh New Town, and um, you can go onto UNESCO uh, website and find out all the other sites. There are plenty within, uh, within the UK and uh, within Europe and uh, worldwide. A more local way of protecting works is by using a conservation area and uh, we did talk about this in previous um, 
lecture series. Um, these are primarily local uh, protection areas where we're looking for a special architectural or historic interest. So they can be um, collections of houses or streets which are um, built in a certain way or are, are kind of interesting to protect or there could have been an activity, a historic activity which happened in that area which is worth um, protecting. And really we're trying to look for some way of preserving the, the, the character of that area. Um, Aberdeen has 11 conservation areas, some very small, um, fitty, as we see in the, the image here, or, or foot D, um, is protected because of the, the form of the, the buildings and the layout of the buildings. Some larger areas, such as the Rubus Law Conservation Area, are um, protected because they have uh, kind of significant streetscapes or the layout of them is significant and generally we would say that working within uh, working on buildings within a conservation area will always require planning permission permitted development rights are usually suspended and coming down to single buildings um, we can use a list of building status to protect um, individual buildings and these are individual buildings which are architecturally interesting or historically important. Um, depending on their level of importance, they are usually listed under A, B or C, and um, that usually kind of relates back to um, the, the kind of s the sphere of influence of the importance, if you like. So um, A being, being kind of nationally important, um, right down to C, which is a, a kind of a good local building that they want to preserve. And within Scotland, there are currently um, 3,700 Category A listed properties. Um, probably the bulk of those, or um, the city with the largest proportion of those, is, uh, is Edinburgh. So why should we care about built heritage? If we think about students passing through um, architecture courses or um, surveying courses um, or other built environment courses, when they graduate and progress through their career, most of the buildings that they're going to be working on or that they'll see around about them have already been built. Um, the built environment is not static, but there are a considerable number of buildings that you'll be working on or students will be working on in future that have already been here. So there's going to be challenges and opportunities for built environment professionals to um, learn, to uh, live with and work with aging buildings. And some of those challenges can be summed up as adapting unusual spaces. We have to think about the way that buildings were built in the past, um, that perhaps they weren't the most suitable to the way that we live now. Um, we now, uh, thankfully have recognized that um, access is a, is a significant issue for buildings. So we have to be able to adapt historic buildings. And we want to be able to improve energy efficiency. The way we heat buildings and the way we occupy them is different from um, previous generations. We also need to look after the buildings. So we have to think about how materials are weathered. And um, we'll be looking at preserving the, the entire structure, the entire building as well. So there's a number of different things that a built environment professional has to think about. So in terms of adapting spaces, um, a lot of historic buildings have small rooms. They were designed to be heated by um, individual fires. And we can see in this image here, there's lots of chimneys to either side. So each room would have had its own fire. Um, but that's not really how we, how we work now. And we prefer to have um, kind of more open spaces. So sometimes we have to be creative with using existing um, structures and uh, adapting them to be able to create new spaces. So creating loft spaces and building out dormers to get um, more space within within historic buildings. For uh, universal access, we have to think about um, how we access uh, into the building and also how we, um, how we allow movement uh, within the building. 
and uh, a number of our significant um, buildings um, were built you know, with very poor disabled access. So how do we retain the character of a building while still allowing um, everyone the opportunity to uh, enjoy them? When it comes to energy efficiency, um, because of the way that we we occupied buildings and we heated them, and you know a lot of buildings were built in the time when when coal was the the, the primary heat source. Um, we were heating small rooms at a time. Um, the fuel was sort of comparatively cheap, but with current views on uh, carbon emissions and energy efficiency within buildings, we have to consider ways to be able to improve the energy efficiency of existing buildings. Um, the building in the centre of this image here has been uh, has been improved, so we can see that it is um, emitting less heat than the buildings around about it. The, 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 the kind of orange and yellow buildings are uh, allowing a lot of heat to pass through the building fabric, whereas if we can improve existing buildings, then we can um, make the occupants uh, time within the building much easier. We can cause them to spend less money on fuel and make it more efficient to heat them. And as part of um, working on existing buildings, we have to think about traditional skills that are available and where those um, traditional skills are going to be employed, but also how we train up new generations and keep traditional skills alive to be able to, to work on existing buildings. And of course, if we want our built heritage to be um, retained for future generations, we have to think about um, retaining whole buildings. And sometimes that means um, protecting them, taking them into public ownership, um, and uh, like has been done with many uh, castles within Scotland, they pass into the ownership of public bodies who are going to look after them and they become um, museums effectively. So what do we want from our, our heritage buildings is, an, is another consideration. So in conclusion, the built heritage is an important asset and informs a great deal of what we think about our surroundings as part of our national identity. Buildings from the past can provide us with opportunities to learn from the skills of pre previous generations. We can look at the way that they built and the materials that they built with and can help us connect to our identity. Um, given this role, our built heritage is protected in a number of different ways, and we have a number of different bodies depending on how the building is uh, seen either at local, national or international importance levels. So aspects that you should take from this lecture are that protection for buildings can be local, national or international, that we need to think creatively in order to adapt existing buildings, and we need to work for problems that we currently have and relate them to the existing building stock, that a significant amount of work will be required to keep our heritage buildings standing, and that new skills and specialisms in the built environment profession will develop.